Greeting Earthlings! This morning we are going to be discussing hysteroscopy, both diagnostic and operative approaches. This is in conjunction with the hands-on simulation and skill session that we'll be doing Wednesday morning. My hope is that you will find this presentation informative and provide some basics to hysteroscopy as well as the approaches that we use with some of the different uh, technologies that we'll have the opportunity to work with Wednesday morning from the uh, device representatives. My hope is that you'll be able to watch this video in the next few days uh, and that it will provide good basics as far as our approach to hysteroscopy and answer a lot of questions that you may have. We will have time Wednesday morning to answer questions as a group and to do some further discussion. So to get into it, so hysteroscopy, diagnostic and operative, an overview. So why do we do hysteroscopy? Uh, in general, it's to evaluate uterine pathology. Uh, one of the chief complaints that we see in the office is abnormal uterine bleeding, AUB. So that's a very common reason for looking inside the uterus. We do that as both a diagnostic and therapeutic approach. In general, endometrial thickening, the presence of any kind of a mass that can be either palpated with exam or seen with imaging, and a suspicion of intrauterine adhesions, uh, as well as a diagnostic approach um, oftentimes these suspicions of pathology have been found via exam, uh, ultrasound, sometimes as incidental findings, uh, as well as SHG and HSGs. We also do hysteroscopy to retrieve, quote, lost IUDs. And not as frequently, but hysteroscopy may play a role in infertility evaluations as well. As far as the indications specifically for operative hysteroscopy, most of the time we are both evaluating but then treating uh, an intrauterine mass such as a polyp or fibroid, uh, endometrial ablation, which we'll talk about the different technologies that can be used for that. Uh, resection of a uterine septum is something that is done via hysteroscopy, not commonly, uh, but we will look at some of the instruments and approach to that. Lysis of adhesion, specifically Asherman syndrome, which we'll talk about further as well. And in the past, uh, hysteroscopy was used for sterilization with the placement of uh, transtubal occlusion like the Escher system, um, but that has uh, obviously not been used recently. As far as contraindications to hysteroscopy, obviously any type of pregnancy with a question of viability, any active pelvic infection, including active HSV or malignancy. We obviously do hysteroscopy, both diagnostic uh, and combined with a dilation and curatage to retrieve endometri uh, endometrial sampling uh, in the context of abnormal bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding. Uh, so we're investigating the question of malignancy, but we're not doing hysteroscopy if there is a known malignancy. As far as complications, like any surgical procedure, there can be uh, issues with hysteroscopy. It is uh, minimally invasive, but we're still uh, introducing instruments into the uterine cavity. Uh, the overall incidence of complications is around 0.2%. Uh, you can see that diagnostic has a lower incidence of complication, mainly because with just placement of the hysteroscope and not any active uh, resection of tissue, um, there is a lower risk of complication. Uh, the most common complication here, uterine perforation, but only 0.12%. Uh, fluid overload, especially with um, fluid management systems that we have at our disposal, uh, is quite rare at 0.06%. Uh, hemorrhage, whether it's from the operative site, perforation of the uterus, or cervical laceration, 0.03%. Um, Bladder GI injury is quite rare. Infection endometritis, also quite rare. Um, we'll talk about that again in just a minute. Uh, and then as far as uh, any sort of uh, electrocautery or thermal injury, uh, also quite rare. Uh, 
the risk of that does go up slightly if there's been any kind of a uh, thinning of the uh, endometrium uh, and myometrium in the past, uh, specifically uh, removal of fibroids, so myomectomy, uh, which can leave a thin area in the myometrial wall, and so abdominal contents bowel or anteriorly bladder can be closer proximity, uh, and so receive some of that uh, thermal energy. Um, I've not seen any evidence that suggests that uh, low transverse C-section or classical C-section is associated with an increased risk there. Uh, and then finally, air embolism, which is also a, a rare complication. That obviously is a bit more of a risk with operative as opposed to diagnostic hysteroscopy, because once you're breaching the uh, endometrium and getting into the myometrium, uh, there's more of a risk of uh, gas uptake into the vascular system. So as far as general considerations with the timing of hysteroscopy, we'd like to do it when the lining is thin. Um, this is usually early in the prol proliferative phase, uh, especially if it's immediately post-menstrual. Uh, this also reduces risk of pregnancy. Well, of course, we'd always get a pregnancy test, uh, usually a serum HCG, uh, before proceeding with uh, hysteroscopy. As far as pretreatment with any type of progestin, um, you would not want to do this for any sort of diagnostic approach because you want to be able to evaluate the endometrium uh, in its you know, native state, so to speak. Uh, for operative uh, hysteroscopy for resection of tissue, you can do 10 days uh, of a progestin like Provera and then have a withdrawal bleed obviously timing the, uh, the hysteroscopy itself to when that bleeding is happening can be uh, a bit tricky. Uh, as far as cervical preparation, uh, a meta-analysis showed that pre- and postmenopausal women who are treated with mesoprostol were less likely to need further mechanical dilation, uh, and they had fewer complications, specifically uh, perforation and less intra-op and post-operative pain. For postmenopausal women treated uh, with vaginal estrogen cream, for two weeks prior to the procedure and then a progestin, uh, it was seen that there's some augmentation of the effect as opposed to progestin alone. Uh, and then we we're gonna, said we were going to come back and talk about the idea of infection as a, a potential complication of hysteroscopy. Antibiotics are not routinely given because that risk of infection is quite low. Let's talk about positioning. Uh, as you all know, I really stress that positioning is our responsibility as the surgeon. So oftentimes it will be the nursing staff and sometimes with anesthesia input uh, who will kind of dictate positioning if we're not in the room. So it's important for us to be present and to make sure that both from a patient safety perspective and uh, access visualization uh, for the surgery that we're doing, uh, that we get the patient set up in the uh, appropriate way. With the Allen stirrups, uh, we've got candy canes shown here, um, which I don't know that people really use at York Hospital right now. Uh, the Allen stirrups uh, shown here on the left are quite a bit more common. And as far as the arrangement of this, we want the pivot point down here to line up with the hip, the ball and socket. So when we move the, the stirrup itself, that it's moving the hip right in line with the joint. What we really want to be paying attention to here is angle of hip flexion and then also flexion of the knee. Uh, we want to position a patient in such a way that we avoid or at least greatly reduce the risk of nerve injury. Uh, and this is a risk that occurs in approximately 2% of all uh, surgeries that are done uh, in the lithotomy position. Uh, most commonly, the nerves affect are the sciatic, the femoral, and the peroneal. And we'll take a little bit more of a look here with this. Uh, we traditionally do, for any kind of vaginal access, do a higher lithotomy. And so what we're looking at here is a 90 to 100 degree uh, angle for the knee. For the hip, we want something greater than 60 degrees. So we don't want to have the hip hyperflexed. Uh, we don't want to have the knee hyperflexed either. As far as low lithotomy, we tend to do this if we're doing either a laparoscopic approach. So for a hysterectomy where we do have a, a uterine manipulator in place, or occasionally for abdominal hysterectomy if for some reason we need vaginal or uh, bladder access at the end of the procedure. So for this low lithotomy, when we're looking here at angle of hip flexion, we want that to be 170 degrees, but not greater than 180. So we don't want the hip to be hyper um, extended.
We obviously use Trendelenburg per uh, position for most pelvic surgery. Uh, the benefit of this is that we move abdominal contents uh, cranially, so we clear uh, the more mobile parts of the GI tract, so small bowel and omentum, uh, out of the way. Uh, as we've talked about in the operating room, we tend to focus on moving those contents initially and then seeing with the uh, sigmoid how much mobility there is there. Occasionally we'll do a little bit of a lysis of adhesion or freeing up the sigmoid at the left pelvic brim. Uh, Trendelenburg position also provides just better vaginal access in general. If you do a steep Trendelenburg, so greater than 30 degrees, there is a risk of brachial plexus injury. You can see here they've got the uh, cushions for the shoulders, they've got arms tucked here. Use of those uh, supports will decrease the risk of the patient sliding um, and having the arms tucked, <clears throat> excuse me, decreases the risk of any nerve injury. If you do have the arms out, we wanna be less than 90 degree angle here between the thorax and the arm. When it comes to Trendelenburg position, we also use that for adequate positioning of the weighted speculum. You can see here with a patient that is parallel to the floor that the blade of the weighted speculum uh, is going to be parallel to the floor as well. And so that's going to leave the weighted part hanging off at an angle and it's going to tend to fall out a bit. So when we do Trendelenburg, we get the blade of the speculum lined up with our uh, vaginal access but then this creates the weighted aspect of the speculum being perpendicular to the floor. So it is able to kind of hang in space and give us that nice downward traction that we're looking for while remaining in place. So nerve injury in general has an increased risk if a patient's in lithotomy for greater than four hours. Uh, as we've talked about in the operating room, uh, what I typically do when we place the patient in lithotomy is to go through the full range of motion with the legs that we're going to need during the procedure, but then have a reduced amount of lithotomy for prep and drape. Go into the steeper lithotomy only for the procedure itself. As soon as we're finished, bring the legs down a bit for uh, cleanup and then uh, getting the patient placed supine again. As far as areas that we're concerned about for injury, the femoral nerve here where it exits through the uh, pelvis, um, the obturator nerve here internally uh, running along the adductor, the sciatic nerve here, which we talked about, and then lateral compression here, which is an issue with both candy cane and Allen stirrups, uh, can affect the peroneal nerve, and then also in the popliteal fossa here, the posterior tibial nerve can be affected. With the femoral nerve, uh, hyperflexion of the thigh can put extra pressure there. Uh, injury to the femoral nerve can create weakness of the quads and the iliopsoas, so flexion of the hip, as well as numbness of the anterior and medial thigh. The peroneal nerve, uh, as we talked about, lateral compression uh, from the upper part of the, uh, the footrest in the boot uh, can lead to pressure there. Injury to the peroneal nerve can uh, be related to foot drop, weak dorsiflexion and inversion of the foot, and also numbness of the lower lateral leg. Injury to the tibial nerve, uh, which again can be from pressure in the popliteal fossa, uh, can create a weak plantar flexion, toe extension, numbness along the back of the leg and the sole of the foot. As far as the bladder, uh, what do we do with it? This is a question that I commonly ask uh, of the uh, residents at the beginning of the case. Do we catheterize? Do we have the patient avoid prior? Doesn't matter. Uh, why we want an empty bladder is that it helps with alignment of the pelvic organs. Uh, it also uh, reduces the risk of bladder injury by getting the bladder uh, drained and out of the way. Both for vaginal and intra-abdominal surgery, whether it's laparoscopy or open cases, it also aids in the visualization of tissue. If you've ever done a laparoscopy uh, with a relatively full bladder, it really does obscure uh, the uterus and sometimes even up to the cornea and ad adnexal structures as well. What I typically do is to have a patient avoid uh, immediately prior to leaving uh, the short stay unit. Um, if that's not possible, then I will typically do a straight cath in the OR. Uh, a Foley we usually reserve for either open cases or extended cases. If I'm doing a diagnostic laparoscopy and I'm not sure how long we might be for a cystectomy or oophorectomy, 
uh, if there's going to be possible lysis of adhesion, something that might take a bit longer, then I will place a foley at the beginning of the case with the plan of taking it out at the end of the case. Any catheterization can lead to increased risks of infection and post-operative discomfort, so we just need to be mindful of catheterizing the bladder and really only do it if we need to. If having the patient avoid prior to the OR is adequate, which for most outpatient procedures it is, then you can avoid catheterization altogether. So as far as the cervix itself, visualization, what can we do? Well, we've got our weighted speculum down here. And again, we talked about that Trendelenburg position to get this to really hang down perpendicular to the floor. Uh, there are various lengths of weighted speculum. The shortest length is uh, inadequate for many of our patients. There is a medium length and then the long duckbill speculum that tends to be used for vaginal hysterectomy. Um, if the weighted speculum is not doing the trick, you can also use a right angle retractor inferiorly as well. And then here we've got a, a thinner right angle retractor, a Haney retractor that's uh, retracting the uh, anterior vaginal wall. So good visualization of the cervix here. Uh, as far as the tenaculum, we're looking here at a antiverted uterus. And so they have the tenaculum on the anterior lip with traction on the tenaculum that straightens out the uterus. Seems a little counterintuitive. You'd almost think that pulling on the posterior aspect, uh, the posterior lip of the cervix would create better alignment, um, but that's not the case. For a retroverted uterus here, uh, the, specu uh, the speculum is placed and then the tenaculum is on the posterior lip. Uh, and again, traction on that leads to a straightening out of the uterus. And what we're really concerned with here and we can see it up here in our ultrasound picture. So here's kind of external os, here is cervix. So external os, cervical canal, and internal os perhaps here. And we've got this bit of a change in angle coming up into the cavity itself, the endometrium, uh, and then obviously fundus up here is transvaginal probe. So straightening the uterus really helps with this cervico-uterine angle here. The more we can straighten that out, uh, the easier sounding and dilation and instrumentation are going to be also thinking of perforation, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, one of the most common places of perforation is via the internal os and then kind of out the posterior uh, wall of the uterus. Per cervical block, typically use 1% lidocaine either with or without epinephrine. And there are a couple of uh, different approaches to this. The kind of four o'clock and eight o'clock. Uh, you can also place a bit at the site of the tenaculum here. They actually have kind of an alice grasping the anterior lip. Uh, you can also do kind of a four position placement. Here they're showing a bit of a triangular placement for an intracervical block. Um, with the paracervical, studies have shown that it does reduce intraoperative, but not necessarily postoperative pain. Um, it's unclear whether a patient's need for either parenteral or oral analgesics is reduced postoperatively by using a paracervical. As far as complications or issues with paracervical, a vasovagal response is possible just from the injection itself. Uh, so especially if you're doing this uh, in the office, uh, you need to be mindful of that. And as you know from the operating room, i like you to not only announce the uh, placement of a local anesthetic specifically what it is, whether it's with or without epinephrine, but for paracervical to specifically announce that and what volume of uh, anesthetic they're going to be receiving, just so that anesth anesthesia knows uh, what we're doing there. As far as symptoms from an intravascular uptake, perioral tingling, tinnitus, metallic taste in the mouth, and dizziness, uh, the effects uh, with an intravascular uptake can be hypotension, although really just labile uh, blood pressures and bradycardia as well. So if you're going to be doing a paracervical, it's important to have appropriate resusc resuscitative equipment available. Again, speaking of doing that in the office. Uh, when it comes to dilation, so again, we're looking here at external os, internal os. Here's a nice hysteroscopic look to the cervix itself. So that's what we should be seeing as we're entering the external os and proceeding up the canal. Um, when it comes to dilators, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the different types in just a second. And we'll have discussed this earlier uh, in the year when we discuss surgical instruments in general. Uh, the blue plastic dilators here 
are some uh, disposable dilators that you can use in the office. They're very handy uh, because they are quite small, uh, so the patients tend to tolerate them well. And if you have just a, a bit of cervical stenosis or need just a little bit of help for endometrial biopsy uh, up to IUD placement, uh, they can be very beneficial. Uh, here we've got lacrimal uh, duct probes. These are flexible and come in different sizes. So if you have significant uh, stenosis of the external os, or if it's really scarred over, you can use these to very gently probe to find that opening. Uh, here, Hegar dilators, as you know, those are my favorite. Um, I like the fact that they don't have a lot of curvature to them. Uh, Size-wise, I just think they're a bit easier to hang on to as well. Uh, you can also, as we have here, Use hydro, uh, hydrostatic pressure, hydro dissection, hydro dilation, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, just by placing the hysteroscope at the external os and turning the fluid on and letting that uh, fluid pressure uh, help to open up the os, open up the canal uh, as much as it will. You can also just in visualizing the external os and the very opening of the canal, uh, use the scope for that and then switch over to dilators knowing which direction, kind of which quadrant you might need to angle into. Uh, as far as cervical stenosis, you can uh, do a couple of things to aid in uh, being able to dilate in the operating room. Uh, prostaglandins, obviously here, um, we've got Cytotec. And why do we have a stomach here? Because it was initially uh, an acid reducer uh, for uh, ulcer and GI protection. Um, so prostaglandins, um, either 400 orally the night before or 200 vaginally uh, the night before. You can also do it the morning of. The recommendations kind of anywhere from four to 12 hours preoperatively, uh, but the morning dose is sublingual, 400. Uh, as far as osmotic dilators, these are uh, laminaria, which is just from seaweed that is compressed. Uh, this is what a laminaria stick looks like. They come in different sizes. Uh, the idea, I've actually never used these, but the idea is to pack as many of those into the cervical canal as you can get, and then they absorb fluid overnight. So you can see here the increase in size from its native state to overnight uh, absorption of, uh, of moisture and the significant increase in size. Obviously, this is uh, a bit more... Uh, swollen than it would be if it had been within the canal and kind of uh, having that compression from the tissue. Uh, laminaria are used a, a bit more commonly in second trimester um, termination or uterine evacuation. So as far as dilators, our old Hegars, shaped like Seagars, Pratts, this is what we most commonly use and are part of our DNC set, and then Hanks that look kind of like the Pratts, but they've got the shanks. Hanks have shanks. Uh, and then again, we've got our lacrimal duct probes here. As far as dilator choice, complete personal preference. With the uterus, we want to do an exam once the patient is asleep. Uh, if you've done that in the office or from imaging, have a good idea of uterine position. I think it's less important, but here we've obviously got an antiverted uterus with not only antiversion, which is Kind of the relationship of the uterine axis to vaginal axis, but then this is antiflexed, so from cervical canal up into uterine cavity, what sort of angulation do we have there? Let's uh, and then looking here, a retroverted uterus and a uterus that's retroverted and retroflexed. So doing an exam under anesthesia will guide your placement of instrumentation. Uh, as far as sounding, we want to be able to shape the sound to fit that normal uterine curvature. Uh, we want, with very gentle pressure, to be following the path of the cervical canal. Uh, as far as uterine size, on average, for a nulliparous patient, the uterus is a cavity length of about seven to seven and a half centimeters nine centimeters in a multiparous patient and kind of five to five and a half uh, in a postmenopausal patient. So some MRI images that just show how really significantly 
angulated the uterus can be. And again, this is without any traction. So placing that tenaculum anterior lip here for an anteverted uterus. Here is a retroverted uterus here, endometrial stripe fundus up here. And then here is a retroverted, but also significantly retroflexed uterus. Look at how deeply that's really buried here into the posterior cul-de-sac. Well, what do we have going on here? Yep, uterine perforation right through that posterior aspect of the fundus. So perforation of the uterus happens in 1% of all gynecologic surgeries. Um, obviously, it's a bit more common in postmenopausal patients, so 2.5% um, for postmenopausal patients. Um, most commonly, perforation is going to happen, as we discussed before, at the internal os and then secondarily at the fundus. Um, in patients who are undergoing postpartum hemorrhage and who have uh, curatage, there's up to 5% uh, uterine perforation. So as you've heard me say many times before, always ultrasound guidance when possible, because when you can actually see the curate inside the uterus, it greatly reduces your risk of perforation. What we have going on here is a patient who had a postpartum curatage for hemorrhage, and this is incarcerated and now necrotic omentum that was pulled into the uterus. This is that same tissue down here, the uterine defect, and after suturing, repairing the defect there. So similar here. This was at the uh, time of chromoperturbation and the uterine manipulator catheter they used perforated the uterus here. This is actually some methylene blue uh, stained fluid that is uh, coming out of the uterus. You can see that dark fluid collecting here in the posterior cul-de-sac. So there's the defect there and doing some laparoscopic suturing for hemostasis. Let's talk about the hysteroscope in general and we will get the chance to uh, play around with a couple of different types of scopes uh, Wednesday morning. When you're placing the scope, you want to get the tip of it at the external os, and then I turn on the fluid uh, full flow to get that pressure to help open up the os, and then as soon as you're in the cervical canal, let that fluid pressure open up the canal as well. Uh, you want to follow the path of the cervix while you're watching on the screen. Uh, what we've got here is a 30 degree scope. So you can see that when the scope is being placed straight into the canal, that the actual view, because of the angled nature of the scope, the 30 degree angle, the view is more of the anterior part of the canal, or the, the ceiling of the canal, um, than of the os itself. Here, where you have a nice central view of the cervical canal, your scope is actually at an angle. So your view is straight ahead, but if you start to advance the scope, you're actually going to be digging into the canal. So what I do is I tilt the scope up like this to be able to check the canal, make sure that things look open, and then drop my hand and then advance the scope straight uh, ahead, straight up the canal, knowing that this is the view here that I'm going to have. Uh, what I typically do is just proceed up the midline until I'm at the fundus, and again, continue with uh, full flow of fluid and with outflow. Uh, I want enough pressure to open up the uterine cavity, but also I do want some egress of fluid to be able to clear out any debris or clot or blood. You also want to try as much as possible to keep the scope in the midline so that you're not really torquing from side to side much, and especially if you have an angled scope you can just twist and rotate the scope itself, but not the camera. We have a picture of that coming up uh, to be able to view up into the corneal areas and see the tubal ostia. So just again here, the red arrow is the direction of travel of the scope itself. If you're just pushing ahead, while the, the blue arrow shows what your view is going to be. So if you have this nice centralized view of the canal looking up into internal os, that's great. 
but if you start pushing the scope this way, you're going to be digging into cervix and then increasing risk of perforation. So check where you're at this way, but then drop your hand down to get that scope straightened out. Here you've got a view more so of the anterior aspect of the canal, and then you can push forward. So counterintuitive, it looks like you're looking up at the top part of the canal, so that's where you're going to be pushing, but in fact not. You're going to be pushing straight ahead up into the uterus. Uh, this is a little bit of an exaggeration of how much you need to move the scope kind of side to side. Um, one of the advantages of the angled scope is that you really don't need to swing it back and forth quite so much, but really just rotation of the scope itself. Again, keeping the camera in the same position, black buttons up towards the ceiling. Um, here they're really angling it not only to be able to see into the corneal area, but really as if they're trying to look up the, uh, the tube, so to speak. If you have the camera more in a midline position and then just back it off from the fundus a little bit, then with your rotation, you're gonna get a view here, rotate it around while keeping it in the midline, and then you're gonna get a view over to this side. So again, just a little bit exaggerated here. This makes uh, more of a difference if you're doing office-based hysteroscopy uh, or have a very light uh, sedation because this sort of torque up here on the cervix is going to add to discomfort for the patient. So when we do hysteroscopy, we're going to see a, a wide variety of findings. What we have here in the upper left is a very normal appearing endometrium. You can just see tubal ostea uh, here on the, the sides. Uh, I think they've actually got these maybe backwards. I think this looks a bit more like a polyp, and I think that looks a bit more like a fibroid. You can see they've got a receptoscope here. They're going to do a little myomectomy there. Um, here, it's hard to say if this is just a uh, septum or Asherman's because it does seem to be very symmetric. You could look throughout the rest of the uh, uterine cavity for the synechiae. Here's a uh, septum here, so you can see kind of going off to the right and left sides up into the cornua. Uh, and this, yes, this is a unhealthy appearing endometrium. Uh, it's just a very thick and irregular appearing, uh, appearance with some increased vascularity. We'll take a look at that in general when we're trying to evaluate for malignancy. As far as distending media, we have uh, several things to pick from. High viscosity fluids are really not used any longer. Uh, this is Dextran. Uh, there's a risk of electrolyte imbalance, DIC, anaphylaxis. Um, what we typically use are low viscosity fluids, either that have electrolytes in them, so normal saline or lactated ringers. Uh, these fluids, however, cannot be used with monopolar uh, instruments because the fluid itself conducts electricity. So you can use normal saline or LR with just a quick diagnostic uh, hysteroscopy. If you're doing some kind of a manual resection, polypectomy, uh, just curatage. If you're using a power morselator, uh, you can do that. Or if you've got bipolar energy, but not monopolar. Uh, electrolyte pore solutions, uh, glycine is the most common. Uh, th those fluids can be used with monopolar uh, resection. Uh, and we'll look at some of those instruments in just a, a minute. In general, most uterine cavity surgery is performed with bipolar energy in a normal saline uh, fluid environment. Just to look at the difference here, this is our monopolar generator. So we've got um, an active electrode that is conducting current uh, to usually just the tip of our instrument. So this is kind of our uh, typical uh, electrocautery pencil or bovie. Uh, we've got a return electrode here, our typical blue pad that takes the current back to the generator. So here, what's happening is the electrical current is passing from the tip of the instrument through the patient's body to our uh, kind of collection pad, return pad, and then uh, back to the generator. The tissue destruction comes from the fact that right at the tip of the instrument, uh, that current flow is concentrated. Uh, tissue, uh, because of the moisture in it, has resistance to flow, so you get the most heat generated right at the tip of the instrument. It very quickly dissipates as there gets to be a greater tissue uh, volume for the current to flow through. So tissue destruction uh, happens right at the tip. 
Now compare that to bipolar, and here we've got something like a uh, usually a bipolar forcep, uh, Kleppinger uh, forcep is what we used to use for tubal fulguration commonly, uh, and with that you've got two sides the uh, active electrode and the return electrode so that the current itself is just passing in a very concentrated fashion through the tissue that you're grasping. So there isn't any passage of current through the surrounding tissue here, it's all just paddle to paddle. As far as using uh, a gas, uh, gas for uh, distension during hysteroscopy, uh, possible but not common, uh, carbon dioxide has been used in diagnostic hysteroscopy. You get a similar image quality. Um, however, if you do have some debris, whether tissue or uh, blood or clot, you know, you're not gonna be able to clear that out as you would with fluid. Uh, patients do report greater pain during and after the procedure with a, a gaseous medium, uh, including cramping and that referred shoulder pain, uh, usually up into the right shoulder. Uh, and then research has also shown that these people do need more uh, analgesics post-op. So more of kind of a curiosity, <clears throat> not something that, uh, that I've seen in my career. Fluid management systems, we've got many things to pick from. What we typically do is either no fluid management system, just with our bag of saline, or the uh, MyoSure system we use fairly frequently, and we'll touch on that a bit more here. Uh, so with the MyoSure system, number five, is our outflow number four is the inflow so from our big saline bags we've got fluid coming in here and then flowing out to the scope here and then as far as return we've got multiple uh, areas of return one is from the outflow that's connected to the instrument itself another is from the outflow that's connected to our under butt drape and collection bag and then if you're using the actual MyAsure device itself, that also has uh, an outflow. The uh, yellow cabling here is just the uh, power uh, cabling for the device itself. Uh, this outflow all comes down through a tissue trap and then into our large collection bag. So it seems like a lot of things to hook up, but in fact, it's a fairly simplistic system that does a very good job of uh, maintaining uh, intrauterine pressure and accurately measuring input and output, and so giving us our deficit. When it comes to fluid imbalance, um, the incidence of this is 0.1 to 0.2%, so one to two patients in a thousand. Uh, as far as the mechanism, it can be intravasation, just taken up directly into the blood vessels, it can be transtubal loss or through uterine perforation uh, with those last two fluid getting into the, uh, the abdominal cavity and then being absorbed through the peritoneal surface. Uh, obviously, if you're doing operative uh, hysteroscopy, you're going to be an increased risk of fluid imbalance, partly because the procedure tends to take longer, uh, but then also by diving into endometrium or myometrium, you're going to be exposing uh, more uh, vascular surface to potential fluid uptake. Uh, this also is something that we monitor with uterine pressure. Um, with a, a operative hysteroscopy, we tend to use a little bit more pressure to get more distension of the uh, endometrial cavity. As far as uh, complications with fluid imbalance, that volume overload can lead to heart failure, pulmonary edema, and a dilutional anemia. The electrolyte imbalance can lead to hyponatremia, hyperglycemia, acidosis, and hyperammonemia. Neurologic consequences, confusion, slurred speech, you would see initially visual changes, seizures are possible, as well as coma. One way to reduce the risk of uh, significant fluid imbalance is to use automatic fluid management systems as we just talked about. Uh, you want to carefully monitor your deficits, use as low of a uterine pressure as you can, and with saline and uh, lactated ringers, with the electrolyte replete isoosmolar fluid, uh, you do have a lower risk of complication, and as we're going to talk about here in a second, can tolerate a bit more of a deficit. So with glycine, with the electrolyte free fluid, uh, complications can occur with as little as a 500 cc imbalance. Uh, if you get up to that 500 cc limit, you really want to start looking at being able to wrap things up. If you get up towards a thousand, you've got to stop the procedure. Uh, with the electrolyte repeat fluid, so again, uh, normal saline lactated ringers, you can really tolerate up to 750 to a thousand mil deficit. Uh, 
um, in high-risk patients or in low-risk healthier patients, even up to a couple of liters, which we really don't ever get to that point. Um, as far as operative hysteroscopy itself, what are we going up inside the uterus to do? Well, it's usually resection. We're usually uh, evaluating pathology and so doing uh, a biopsy in uh, one sense of it or uh, just removal of uh, pathologic tissue, so both in a diagnostic and therapeutic approach. Uh, we can either do that manually, uh, curatage, polyp forceps using a, a resectoscope, uh, or a powered uh, morcellating device like the uh, Myosure. Um, or we're doing ablation, so destruction of the endometrium, getting down to the basalis layer, and Novasure is what we use for that most commonly. Uh, as far as endometrial polyps, I describe those to patients as just overgrowths of the lining of the uterus. Uh, polyps can express both estrogen and progesterone receptors uh, that can play a role in their formation, especially in postmenopausal women, and can be related to monoclonal endometrial hyperplasia, overexpression of endometrial aromatase, and somatic gene mutation. Uh, among patients undergoing endometrial biopsy or hysterectomy, just incidental uh, discovery of polyps uh, occurs in 10 to 25 percent. So up to a, a quarter of patients have polyps even if they are asymptomatic with them. Um, there does not seem to be an association between endometrial polyp and early pregnancy loss. As far as risk factors for polyp formation, tamoxifen use, uh, both as far as growth and malignant transformation, um, obesity, obviously that extra uh, estrogen being produced by uh, aromatase in peripheral adipose, specifically a BMI over 30. 52% uh, of patients had polyps with that uh, increased BMI as opposed to just 15% with a BMI less than 30. Um, folks with elevated glucose level, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, uh, postmenopausal hormone therapy replacement, obviously that uh, estrogen can lead to some stimulation of the lining, or anybody that's had polyps in the past is at a, a risk to have recurrence. What do we do with polyps in postmenopausal patients? They need to be removed for uh, oftentimes for treatment resolution of bleeding, uh, but specifically for pathologic exam. In premenopausal patients, we remove them if they're symptomatic. So if somebody's having uh, menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea that we think may be related to them, if there are multiple polyps, if they are prolapsed uh, down into or through the cervix, if there are recurrent polyps, if the patient is at a higher risk of hyperplasia or endometrial cancer, again, back to uh, BMI, uh, unopposed or uh, and ovulation, so higher levels of uh, estrogen without progestin withdrawals. Uh, if the polyp is of a bigger size, over 15 millimeters, and again, this question of infertility, although studies have shown that uh, polyps uh, really don't increase uh, the risk of early pregnancy loss. What do they look like? So here on ultrasound, we've just got this kind of general thickening of the endometrium here. This looks like maybe internal os here, so endometrium is relatively thin, and then boom. So here with our sonohistogram, putting some saline up in the uterus, really get a clarification of the cavity versus the pathology. Got a bit of Doppler flow here, so there's some vascular feed into that polyp, and same thing here. So again, it looks like internal os here, external os cervix is down here, so cavity is looking good, and then boom, up at the fundus. Polyps can uh, obviously have quite a variety of appearances. So we've got everything from kind of a single solitary polyp here to multiple. Uh, they can have a more polypoid, so really projecting out of the endometrium versus kind of a sessile uh, sort of appearance. Here's a little bit of a mixture, multiple polyps here, here, and this apparently is just a normal endometrium. 95% of endometrial polyps are benign. Uh, but there is a higher risk of malignancy in postmenopausal patients and those who present with abnormal bleeding. Uh, on this side, we have benign appearance. And on this side, questionable for hyperplasia malignancy. So look at this increased vascularity, thick branching vessels. Here, a little bit more of a solid appearance to it. This sort of irregularity as opposed to benign polyps here. Uh, 
not nearly as vascular, relatively smooth. So quite a contrast there. Fibroids, um, we're going to look a little bit about location and treatments here. We're going to be focusing mainly, of course, on the intracavitary and submucosal. So fibroids can have a bit of an increased blood flow compared to polyps. We've got some nice big vessels there. I think they have a little bit more of a lobulated appearance. Here's one that is submucosal and you can just kind of almost imagine how that's projecting up into the myometrium. Um, there is a classification system for location of lyomyoma. We're not really going to go through that much. What we're interested in is just in general kind of type 1, submucosal, type 2, um, subserosal. We're not really going to talk much about specific transmural uh, and then type 3 a bit more pedunculated. When it comes to kind of scoring uh, myometria uh, and fibroids, we're looking at the uh, size. So obviously the bigger, the more challenging removal is going to be. Uh, this is really just looking overall at ideas of treatment and what's our chance for success with a hysteroscopic resection. So the bigger it is, the more challenging topography. Uh, not a big, big difference here. A little bit more challenging if you're right up at the fundus, mid position, or lower down is the easiest to remove. Um, the extension of the base. So if you're a little bit more uh, kind of just stuck on, that's going to be easier to remove uh, as opposed to a big, broad base here. Uh, degree penetration, again, the more kind of polypoid uh, the fibroid is, the easier it's going to be to remove. And if the myoma is on the lateral wall, um, that can add a little bit of difficulty. It's easier if it's anterior or posterior. So with a total score of 0 to 4, uh, that's kind of a, a, what they call group 1, so a relatively low complexity to the hysteroscopic resection. Uh, 5 or 6 points, a bit more complex. You could consider giving a preoperative um, GRNH analog to try to shrink that down a little bit or performing a two-stage procedure where you go in and do a partial resection uh, and then go back later to remove the rest. Um, if you've got seven to nine points, then hysteroscopic removal is not recommended. All right, here we have our resectoscope setup. You can see that we've got the, uh, the outer sheath here with fluid inflow, um, the inner sheath here with outflow. Usually this is flipped around so it's pointing down. Um, and then we've got a couple of the different uh, devices that we can use here. We'll look at those again in just a second. So this is looking at a wire loop resectoscope. You can use this to carve out uh, and resect fibroids, polyps, this used to be used for endometrial ablation as well. And this can either be a monopolar or bipolar device. Looking here, we've got, again, inflow up top, outflow down here. Fingers, thumb hole here. And the part of the device that has the camera attached moves forward and backward this rod here is part of the uh, control arm for the device itself. So here you can see the wire loop being used to resect what looks like maybe a, a fibroid. Um, as far as power morselating uh, devices, we've got the uh, TrueClear and the MyAssure. Here's our fluid management system that we talked about. Um, I think that we'll have a chance to look at both of these on Wednesday. As far as endometrial ablation, uh, here's an old school. This was being done as early as the uh, late 1800s. The Kungelsonden electrode, which is a uh, basically just a ball-tipped electrode that was placed uh, and then used blindly to um, ablate the endometrium. Uh, indications for endometrial ablation, specifically it's menorrhagia. Uh, as far as dysmenorrhea, no, technically not an indication, although if somebody is amenorrheic or having uh, greatly reduced menstruation, usually dysmenorrhea will get better. 
um, endometriosis, adenomyosis, uh, probably will not be affected significantly, although anecdotally a lot of patients do report an increase in symptoms and so high patient satisfaction with ablation uh, even though you're not directly addressing um, endometriosis implants or adeno. As far as contraindications to ablation, obviously pregnancy, um, hyperplasia or undiagnosed uh, abnormal bleeding, uh, endometrial cancer, active infection, an IUD in place, uh, and then the idea of you know any sort of myomectomy, uh, transmyometrial surgery, or where you've got significant thinning of the myometrium, uh, because if you've got a real thinned myometrium here, you're going to be at increased risk of thermal damage to surrounding structures. As far as ablation devices, we've got the Novasure, uh, thermal balloon, and then kind of free-flowing hydrothermal behind my head here. With the uh, technique uh, energy-based approaches, the Novasure, which uses radio frequency ablation, uh, her option, which is cryotherapy, uh, I think maybe one or two people use that uh, in York, uh, a hydrothermablator, which is just freely circulating uh, heated fluid, Thermochoice is a liquid-filled balloon uh, that is no longer available, and Minerva is kind of a combination, so down here in the, uh, the bottom left behind me, uh, a combination of thermal and bipolar radio frequency. You can also, if you want to go old school, use a resectoscope, so a rollerball, the wire loop, or vaporizing electrode. Uh, technically speaking, you can use laser as well. I've never seen or heard of that being done. Uh, considerations for ablation, it does not increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancer, but it could obscure detection of future abnormalities by preventing or delaying vaginal bleeding associated with hyperplasia or cancer. Uh, histologic sampling can also be difficult and limited uh, in its interpretation because of destruction of the endometrium, and there's no real data on endometrial lining or thickness in post ablation patients when it comes to evaluating postmenopausal bleeding uh, and do you use that same kind of four millimeter cutoff. Um, there's also a very relevant question of endometrial ablation. Uh, is that best for ovulatory menorrhagia only? Um, we know that there are cases of endometrial cancer after ablation having been reported in patients who have chronic anovulation and so then developing hyperplasia. Uh, the authors in UpToDate suggest, quote, progestin supplementation should be offered to prevent hyperplasia until ovulation is reestablished or menopause occurs, end quote. This is in patients that have had an ablation performed. Uh, correction of anovulation is optimal or the use of progestins. And then finally here, in the absence of high quality data, the decision to perform endometrial ablation in patients with risk factors for endometrial cancer depends mainly upon three factors. The degree to which endometrial ablation may limit future diagnosis of malignancy, the magnitude of the risk of endometrial cancer, and the feasibility of other therapy options to treat the menorrhagia specifically. So here's our wire loop, just digging it out, roller ball and the barrel, uh, and this is just mowing the lawn back and forth, extend up to the fundus, draw back towards you as you activate the electrode back up to the fundus and just do this circumferentially uh, around the endometrial cavity obviously as you get up to the cornua and the fundus it's a little harder with the fundus you just have to kind of come up and spot weld uh, across it um, here we've got a roller ball the wire loop this is just a single electrode we'll look at that in a minute Uh, the Novasure ablation we'll have a chance to talk more about and do some hands-on. Obviously, we use this most frequently. Um, her option, Minerva, other options that we have available as well. So let's talk about uterine uh, anomalies here for a moment. Um, there is a broader classification than this. We're going to simplify it down a bit. We're going to talk about uh, briefly bicornuate uterus, uh, didelphus, and the septate uterus here. So most uterine anomalies are diagnosed incidentally or during a workup for either bleeding or repeated pregnancy loss. Uh, 
Uh, you should look for renal anomalies anytime you find a uh, uterine anomaly uh, because renal anomalies uh, pop up in 20 to 30 percent of congenital uterine anomaly uh, findings. And <clears throat> excuse me, there is an incidence of about 5 percent of uterine anomalies in just random population, 8 percent in patients who have fertility concerns. 12% uh, uterine anomalies occurring in patients that have a history of miscarriage and up to 24%, so almost a quarter of patients who have a miscarriage and infertility uh, in their history and uh, current diagnoses. Uh, septate uterus is associated with poor pregnancy outcomes while just an arcuate uterus is not. Up here we've got a bit of an arcuate uterus. <clears throat> And there are specific measurements you can get into as far as the depth of this versus the width of the cavity. That's a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Uh, Bicornate uterus, uterus is associated with spontaneous abortion uh, miscarriage in approximately 36% um, in preterm birth, 21 to 23%, and overall fetal survival, 50 to 60% of patients. So bicornate uterus uh, definitely with higher risk of um, poor pregnancy outcomes. When it comes to evaluating the uterus uh, via ultrasound, and then here obviously we have our hysterosalpingogram, HSG, um, which again, this one may be with a bit of an arcuate shape to it. Uh, but coming over here where we really have a division to two sides of endometrial cavity, and the question is, is this a single uh, kind of uterine body with septum? or is this a didelphus? Uh, as you can see, you can't really tell just from the HSG. What you need to do is an MRI or laparoscopy to evaluate what's going on with the uterus itself. Um, there are different approaches to treating this, including uh, relatively narrow kind of wedge resections, a couple of different tri types of uh, metroplasty, uh, if it really is just a septum, to be able to come up and remove the septum itself. Again, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, as far as who do you treat that has a uterine septum, um, patients that have a septum with recurrent pregnancy loss after exclusion of other causes of recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, or patients with dysmenorrhea if medical therapy has not been effective. Those are patients that you can look at actually doing a, a septoplasty or metroplasty for. Uh, patients with a bicornate uterus and recurrent pregnancy loss, also candidates, and patients that have a non-communicating uterine horn, but with functional endometrium, um, those patients oftentimes have a hematometria and a pelvic pain that warrants intervention as well. Uh, in patients that are completely asymptomatic, surgical correction is, is not indicated. Um, also, correction is not in, uh, indicated in patients with primary infertility, because these uterine anomalies uh, typically do not prevent conception implantation. So it's not a um, getting pregnant issue, it's a potentially staying pregnant issue. So here we've got this nice relatively thin isolated septum in the midline. Here's one that's a bit more broad. And here's our little bar electrode being used to just push up into that septum and resect it. Uh, we're gonna ignore these MRI images here uh, this is kind of the different stages of resection. So pushing in, you can see the division of tissue here, getting to kind of communicating that left and right side. Um, and then as far as, you know, how far do you take this? When do you stop uh, that resection? Um, you, you have a couple of indicators. One is that you get a, a bit of a change in the tissue appearance. So you can see how this uh, here is getting to be a little bit more kind of pink. There's a little bit more blood flow there. We haven't getting, gotten into any active bleeding at all. Um, but when you get into bleeding, you know that you're getting into more normal myometrium. Uh, and so that's a time to stop. You can also use, and I would always advocate, uh, ultrasound guidance for this, or you can look, uh, laparoscopically as well to see, you know, when you might be getting, uh, to the end of the septum and into the normal myometrium. All right. So just a couple of examples here. Again, we've got external os probably just off the uh, the screen here if cervix is like this here's internal os cervical canal and then up into our endometrium so we've got a nice thick endometrium here but that's not really focal a little bit more fundus 
Uh, is that normal, abnormal? Yeah, hard to say. Uh, especially if we could time this so that we were maybe, you know, kind of like day uh, kind of five through seven of the cycle. So just post menstrual, um, we would expect this to be nice and thin. So we see that thickening. Uh, we're a little suspicious for pathology and need to investigate further. So here's our sonohistogram. Oh, look at that. We've got nice filling of the cavity here with fluid, but then this appearance of a bit more of a sessile uh, sort of mass. We can see the, the deep component of it here. That looks like maybe fibroid. Uh, here you see a little bit of fluid surrounding here all the way around, and maybe the connection, the base of it's here, get a bit of fluid around here as well. Um, this was a polyp. So what do you see here? We've definitely got this space-occupying lesion here. They're measuring about four by eh, four centimeters. Fibroid versus polyp, uh, is this purely intracavitary? Is it a transmural fibroid that has a submucosal component? Hard to say. Just exactly how circumscribed is that? I don't know. Let's do an HSG, throw a little fluid in there, see what that does for us. Oh, look at that. Now we can really see the outline of this. So there's a real projection of this in the endometrial cavity. Um, and again, this is a good solid 4.8. That is a big fibroid. Um, when it comes to doing hysteroscopic resection, uh, my limitation is if a fibroid goes more than 50% into the myometrium, I'm not going to be taking that out hystero hysteroscopically. Because as you can imagine, if you had a fibroid that really went transmural, as you're resecting this hysteroscopically, the normal tone of the myometrium is pushing on this, and it can continue to kind of push this up into the cavity, you're shaving away, and all of a sudden you're down to serosa, and hopefully not into bowel. Uh, so a fibroid this size absolutely would need to be removed with a laparoscopic or open um, you know, abdominal myomectomy. You could, I guess, try to do this as a bit of a two-stage procedure and come and just resect kind of as much as you can and then let things heal up and come back and see if you've gotten any, you know, kind of development of more normal myometrium behind this. And if it's this part of the fibroid here is kind of projected into the cavity a bit more, uh, that's hard to say. This is something that I would absolutely refer to REI uh, and then... Uh, you know, have a discussion about removal of that. If this was a fertility concern, obviously myomectomy would be indicated. If this was a, uh, you know, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia sort of thing, then more likely a uh, hysterectomy with a uh, fibroid that size. So here we've got, and this is a little bit harder to see, but this is the main part of the uh, endometrial cavity here. So you've got this projection and fullness here. Um, what does that look like? Well, again, we can see this is kind of normal appearing um, endometrium here, but we definitely have some distortion uh, of the cavity with this mass here. So throw a little bit of fluid in there. Look at how clear that is. So easy to see that this is a submucosal fibroid. And you know, if this is the uh, upper limit, uh, so this is cirrhosis here, so kind of the upper limit of the anterior uterus. Um, this is, yeah, I mean, we could do a measurement here, get the thickness here, look at thickness kind of here. That's going to be right, probably about that 50%. So this would be a nice, fairly straightforward resection to shave this down, but you're going to be a little bit of a thin spot there. All right, so we've had the chance to go through... The basics of hysteroscopy, including indications, uh, preoperative considerations, complications. We've looked at some of the devices themselves, um, had a chance to review some uterine pathology. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, we will have a chance to do hands-on work on Wednesday. And if you have any uh, thoughts about uh, the slides that we presented, things that we've talked about, uh, as well as questions, then, uh, like I said, we will have a chance to chat about that on Wednesday. Thanks.